On Crime Network's Daily Debrief, everybody. Documents filed in the federal prosecution of actress Lori Loughlin and her husband are shedding some light on how authorities believe her daughter's profile was pumped up in college. A document uncovered by E! News and which appears to reference daughter Olivia Jade describes her as a coxswain with the skills of awareness, organization, direction and steering and says she won gold medals at the San Diego Crew Classic in 2014 and 2016 with a silver medal in between those years, 2015. It also lists medals in the U.S. Rowing Southwest Regional Junior Championships and other significant wins at another competition. The documents also contain apparent references to Olivia Jade's sister. Neither daughter is charged with a crime in the case. Lori Lachlan and her husband are accused of paying half a million dollars in bribes to disguise their daughters as crew team members, even though the daughters did not participate on the team, according to prosecutors. And ultimately, this helped the daughters secure admission to the University of Southern California. Let's talk about this case right now with our guest attorneys tonight, Mike Korobanics and Gigi Gonzalez. So Gigi, this document is described as an internal document which appears to have been prepared by the college for internal dissemination. It looks like a resume, though, if you look at it. Does it incriminate the actual defendants if indeed they're not the ones that prepared it? Yes, it does. This profile is the entire crime. It was prepared by Singer with information provided by the parents. Then this profile was presented to USC uh, administrators on behalf of a person, uh, by a person that was in on the fraud that got the daughter admitted into USC. So it's incredibly damning evidence and it is definitely incriminating. Mike Korobanex, Lachlan and her husband are digging in here saying we didn't do this while many others have accepted pleas. Is it likely or unlikely we'll see witnesses flip and testify against these two defendants? It'll be like a gymnast show. There'll be so many people flipping against them <laughs> because in the federal system, anybody who has a plea or anything of that nature will get credit if they cooperate with the government. And it appears that's what's going to happen here. It very well may if the past is any indicator of the future. Mike and Gigi will talk to you again in a second. Actor Jesse Smollett's attorneys are accusing Chicago prosecutors of playing politics by securing a new indictment against him. We brought you the news last night here on The Debrief as Smollett was indicted on six counts of disorderly conduct. That move came after a special prosecutor picked up the case. The original prosecutor refused to move forward with charges against Smollett related to this alleged racist and homophobic attack you saw there on body cam camera footage. Police accused Smollett of lying about that attack. Smollett's attorney, Tina Glandian, says this indictment raises serious questions about the integrity of the investigation, not the least of which is the use of the same CPD detectives who were part of the original investigation to conduct the current investigation despite Mr. Smollett's pending civil claims against the city of Chicago and CPD officers for malicious prosecution. The statement continues saying the charges were appropriately dismissed the first time because they were not supported by the evidence. The attempt to re-prosecute Mr. Smollett one year later on the eve of the Cook County State's Attorney election is clearly all about politics, not justice. Chicago State's Attorney Kim Fox, who shut down the first prosecution of Jesse Smollett, said she hopes the new indictment is about the law and the facts and not about an upcoming election in five weeks. Closing arguments begin tomorrow in the Harvey Weinstein prosecution. The former movie producer faces five counts, including rape and predatory sexual assault. Accusers Mimi Halei and Jessica Mann were backed up at trial by four witnesses who testified about Weinstein's other so-called bad acts. The defense, however, called witnesses who said several accusers were not telling the truth. Ms. Ms. Rotuno will address everything in her closing argument. She will splice it all together to just show that these witnesses did not help the prosecutor meet the highest burden in the land of beyond a reasonable doubt and strip Harvey Weinstein of his constitutional rights to the presumption of it. Law and Crime will be at the closing arguments with recaps tomorrow here on The Debrief. Opening statements today in a cold case murder out of Iowa. Prosecutors in Cedar Rapids say Jerry Burns, now 66 years old, murdered then 18-year-old Michelle Martinko back when Burns was 25. That December 1979 killing went unsolved until DNA tests were invented and then technology to interpret them evolved. Detectives finally settled on a suspect whose DNA they collected from a discarded straw at a pizza place all these years later. 
Authorities say Martinko was stabbed at least eight times in the chest and face. They first thought the crime was committed by someone the victim knew due to the personal nature of the injuries. It's believed, however, this defendant did not know the victim. The DNA evidence at the scene came from the blood the presumed killer left on the victim's clothes and on the gear shift of the vehicle where her body was found. The state began by describing the night of the killing in 1979, just six days before Christmas. She was young. She was just a senior in high school. You'll hear people describe her as a happy young lady friendly, sweet, and kind. She was well liked by her peers. She was viewed as mature for her age. That night, you'll hear that she attended a concert choir banquet at the Sheraton Hotel on the southwest side of Cedar Rapids. You'll hear she left the concert choir and went to the Westdale Mall again by herself. She was dressed well. She had a rabbit fur coat on. The car was still parked at Westdale Mall in the same place where Cedar Rapids police officers would later find it and her body inside of it. The evidence will show in this case that for 39 years, the answers that so many saw lied in a spot and a scraping. Although, however, microscopic, the story that the DNA possessed told enormous information. The information in the science led investigators to one man. The defendant. The defense, however, says the investigation derailed in 2018 and that detectives went after the wrong man. The defense is one of factual innocence. When he was questioned in December of, of 2018 on the anniversary of Michelle Martinko's death, it should come as no surprise that he could not say where he was on that date in 1979 at a well traveled mall, a busy commercial area in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. In 1979, the evidence will show that Jerry Burns was a married man. He was living with his wife and his two young children in Manchester, Iowa, the town in which he was born and raised, where his family had farmed, where he had, had, had eventually established a successful business. You're going to hear, and our expert will demonstrate to you, an expert not only on genetic science and genetic investigation, but also on crime scene investigation, that the handling of the evidence, the likelihood of the intersection of trails of complete strangers demonstrate that the trails do not inevitably lead to Jerry Lynn Burns. One of the victim's childhood friends described the last time she saw Michelle Martinko in 1979. When we were leaving the banquet, we were in the parking lot in the shirt, and, and kind of everybody was like kind of going to their cars because the banquet was over. And we had that discussion about did she wanted to go to the mall, and I wanted to know if she could take me home since my other friends, it was going to be out of their way. And we just all, there were several of us gathered in the parking lot. And then we went about our own ways, and that, she went to the mall. Where did you go that night after the concert choir then? Home, to do my homework. Did you get a call in the middle of the night? I certainly did. From who? Michelle's mother. How would you describe her mother's demeanor on the phone call when she called you? She seemed panicked and frightened. The defense asked his childhood friend about different boyfriends the victim had. Yes, I believe they were exclusive while they were dating. And it was a Mr. Wyrick who was a year older than you or a year older in school than Ms. Martinko. That is correct. And then he went off to Iowa State University. Is that your understanding? That's correct. And her relationship with Mr. Seidel, was it also a serious relationship? To my understanding, it was. Did you uh, spend time with Mr. Seidel and Ms. Martinko as, as a couple? No, I didn't actually know. Uh, I didn't know Mr. Seidel uh, personally. I knew, I knew of him the way I knew Mike. I personally knew because we were school friends. Andy, I didn't personally know. Did uh, Ms. Martinko share with you any concerns that she had about her relationship with Mr. Seidel? Well, there seemed to be some concern that he he just wasn't quite getting over the relationship but 
typical teenage, teenage love. One of the victim's classmates remembers running into Michelle at the mall. Michelle said she was looking to put money down on a coat that she had on layaway. A couple of guys decided that they had to go to the bathroom, so they left, and then we went in with her to um, one of the stores to see if her coat may be on layaway in there. Was she successful in finding her coat when she went to that store? No. Okay. Uh, after you left that store, uh, how much longer were you with uh, Ms. Martinko? Probably just a few more minutes. Okay, and then you parted ways? Yes. I think about the time that we did come out of the store, uh, a friend of hers and a friend of his, they, we, had, we did run into them out in the mall. Just kind of through conversation, I, I found out that uh, Andy was her boyfriend or former boyfriend at the time. Okay, and when you say Andy, are you um, referring to Andy Seidel? Yes. While you were talking with Michelle, uh, did she seem, did anything seem out of the ordinary? No, I didn't get that impression at all. Uh, did she seem like she was scared at all? No. Did she seem concerned? Nope. Did she seem upset? No. It turns out the victim's ex-boyfriend was at the mall where the victim died, buying her a present when they ran into one another. I had an opportunity to go to the mall and hopefully get in and out and purchase her Christmas gift without her seeing me or knowing that what I got. And we kind of entered in and uh, just, I mean, out of the corner of my eye, I saw her. I mean, she was fairly easily recognizable with the blonde hair and she had on a white rabbit coat that I recognized. I mean, she mentioned to me that would it be okay if she gave me a phone call, right? And I said, sure, why not? Okay. Um, but th there was nothing that, that triggered any alarm bells in my mind in terms of her behavior or state of mind at the time. After you went home for the night, did you, um, did you have any contact with uh, Michelle's parents later that night that you recall? Yeah, at some point in the evening, uh, Michelle's mom called, uh, called my parents home and uh, wanted to know if I had heard anything from her. And that's why I said, no, I, have, I hadn't heard anything. And this had now kind of exceeded that threshold timeline of when she said she was going to call. But mm -hmm. I mean, she didn't going to call. She didn't going to call. It did, I, I had no concern at that point until her mom called me. Let's turn to our panel once again this evening here. Mike Krobanex, you're a former prosecutor. It's tough to prosecute a case against a defendant with only DNA and no really clear motive for this defendant to have killed this victim. I couldn't agree with you more, and it, it's scary because I know it's murder and there's no statute of limitations, but everybody's talking about a traumatic event that triggered their memory. If you knew nothing about it and you're a defendant and you're accused of it, how could you even prepare a defense after this much time? Exactly. I, I wonder the same thing here. Gigi, what's the defense doing here? Is the defense raising reasonable doubt with these ex-boyfriends? Are they trying to muddy up the victim's reputation? How did you perceive some of that cross? Well, I did think that the defense did a good job at kind of chopping up uh, Mr. Seidel a little bit. You know, the fact is, is that someone who is close to the victim, possibly a boyfriend, a significant other, they have the best motive to murder the victim than a random stranger on the street. So the fact that you have an ex-boyfriend who's still kind of pining over her, going out of his way to get her gifts and stuff, they did a really good job at trying to point to him as a possible suspect and not the defendant. Appreciate the insight there, Gigi. And still ahead tonight on The Debrief, juries are deliberating in two cases we're following, including the case of a Dallas police officer who shot and killed a young mother. Does this video show self-defense or does it show a crime? Final sentence for the college freshman who said he shot a group of older students at Northern Arizona University because he feared for his own safety. Stephen Jones was ordered to spend six years in prison. It's likely, however, he'll serve only five years with credit for time already served and other good behavior. Jones took the stand in 2017 in a case we covered here at Law and Crime. It ended with a hung jury. Jones finally pleaded guilty to manslaughter and aggravated assault. 
in the attack which killed one and seriously injured several others. To Ohio now, where the jury has the case of a career criminal accused of murdering a young woman. Anthony Pardon is accused of raping, stabbing, and strangling Rachel Anderson on her 24th birthday. Prosecutors say Pardon ordered others to use Anderson's debit card and that his phone was near the victim's apartment when she was killed. And his DNA was found inside her body. Prosecutors closed out the case by saying they met their burden to convict Pardon of kidnapping, raping, committing aggravated burglary, and aggravated robbery towards the defendant or the victim. There is evidence of a struggle. You heard John Kennedy talk about that picture. That was something that meant something to him. Marilyn Monroe was on the ground. Look at her room. That's not how she normally kept it. Male DNA under her fingernails. Hog tie. T-shirt over her head with a cord wrapped around it. And she's naked from the waist down, ladies and gentlemen. Use your common sense and reason. His YSTR DNA is inside her body, inside her vagina. How did it get there, ladies and gentlemen? He has to get her PIN number while she's still alive, guys. It's her brother's birthday. You think Anthony Pardon's going to know her brother's birthday? No. He had to get it from her while she was still alive. While he's committing the theft offense, he has the knife and or recklessly inflicts a serious physical harm. There's a stab wound to the back of her head and neck, and there's a knife found with her blood and hair on it. The defense asked the jury to put aside any feelings of sympathy for the victim and to look closely at the facts of the case. But what we don't know and what we can't put together is who, who did this. You've heard from the experts, you've heard from, I think, 14 witnesses, 13 live witnesses in an interview with Anthony Sleet. And I would disagree with the state because I don't think not one witness came in here and said Anthony Parton was in that apartment. Not one. Detective Howe told you that he gave you that map, showing you where the phone hits. Could be anywhere. Could be. Ladies and gentlemen, those are key words. Could, may, might have. When you ask yourself that in the back, that means the state has not proven to you beyond a reasonable doubt that it is. If they say Anthony could have been there, what's that tell you? Reasonable doubt, because they didn't prove he was. If it could have been his DNA included in a YSTR, what does that tell you? Reasonable doubt. Prosecutors struck back on rebuttal as to what qualifies as reasonable doubt. Evidence is sufficient to show he's using the credit card, he's with his sister, but on the night of the murder, well, let's just disregard that geolocation evidence. That doesn't fill in a gap. That doesn't complete the puzzle. I guess, again, as I sat there, I thought, well, about the only thing that would satisfy Mr. Thomas is if Rachel Anderson walked in here and raised her right hand and told us who did that terrible thing to her. Because Judge McIntosh would tell you that our burden is beyond a reasonable doubt, and I think we talked about it with some of you in voir dire, that it's not beyond a shadow of a doubt or beyond all doubt. Judge McIntosh would tell you our burden is uh, based, reasonable doubt is something based on reason and common sense. It's not mere possible doubt. And everything Mr. Thomas said was raising a mere possible doubt, but it's a doubt that uh, is relating to human affairs or depending on moral evidence. Everything's subject to an imaginary doubt. And Mr. Thomas gave you a parade of imaginary doubts. 
A jury has that case in Ohio right now while a jury in Dallas deliberates the fate of a police officer who fired his weapon while on duty and killed a young woman. Officer Christopher has pulled the trigger 12 times, ending the life of 21-year-old Genevieve Dawes. Hess is charged with aggravated assault by a public servant. That crime carries a possible 5 to 99-year prison sentence. Dawes and her partner are accused of trying to flee when police showed up to investigate whether the vehicle they were sleeping in one night was stolen. A state expert said the vehicle was going less than three miles an hour when Hess opened fire. Hess's defense is that he was protecting himself and other officers. The state, however, said during a rebuttal argument that Hess's actions were just not legally reasonable. And again, we here at the DA's office work with good, hard-working police officers every single day. The majority of them do great work. They follow the law, they do their job, they go home at night. But in this situation, with this defendant, the manner in which he used deadly force on Mr. Dawes, the manner in which he disregarded all the information that he had at that time. You have two minutes. Thank you. The manner in which he shot 12 shots into this vehicle. First, a volley of nine, a break, no reassessment. No looking over to make sure that nobody's behind the vehicle. And then three more shots, hitting her multiple times and killing her. Not to mention, if he actually really, really believed that there were officers over there, and he's putting bullets toward them as well, talking about considering your target in the backdrop. Again, not reasonable. All right, let's turn to our guests one final time tonight. Gigi, we've all seen the video at this point. What do you think? Is this self-defense, defense of another, or is it a crime? It's a crime. You know, you have two kids, right? Young 20, 21-year-old kids who are sleeping in a car. You've got several officers with their guns drawn telling them to back up. They back up, and then they unload 12 bullets into the car, you know, killing a young mother. Uh, you know, how could you justify self-defense in this case when the car was moving, but two, three miles per hour, not enough to hurt anybody? You know, officers are supposed to be specially trained to de-escalate these situations. And in this case, the officer failed to de-escalate this and, in fact, escalated this to a murder. All right, Mike Korobanics, your thoughts? I, I agree with Gigi. This is a horrible case. I, I don't see how they could find any justification. I almost thought the prosecutor was trying to lose the case at points because I thought there were much stronger arguments that could have been made. I know I'm being sarcastic, but that's just the way it seemed to me. Appreciate the insight from the panelists tonight. I'll be back here on The Debrief tomorrow. Remember, closing arguments in the Harvey Weinstein case tomorrow. We will be there.